God is in his throne and he will not be mocked. No. It's wonderful that God warns us and God tells us over and over and over. Should we be surprised? If there's one, two, three more pandemics worse than what we've had, it shouldn't shock us at all. You see, but normally we don't think like that. We don't think like that. God help us. God help us. Because God severely, severely judges arrogant self-reliance. And calls us to obediently respect him. So let my life be the proof, the proof of your love. Let my love look like you and what you made of. I raised the question why is it that the name of Jesus is not mentioned in public much? In the media, in schools, among politicians. Even God is avoided generally. Why is that? But especially the name of Jesus. With the name of Jesus comes a whole bunch of things, right? Especially the issues of judgment. That Jesus died on the cross to pay for our sins. Um... That means that if we don't turn to Christ, we're going to face judgment. And humanity doesn't like that. God is absolutely holy. And that the smallest, tiniest little sin deserves an eternal separation from the Holy One. We don't like that. And so, as human beings, throughout the Bible is shown that human beings... All of us try to suppress the truth. Suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Right? Romans 1 verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven. Revealed from heaven. It doesn't take uh, Fox News, CNN, ABC, NBC, nobody. From heaven. Nobody can miss it. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who, there it is, suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Suppress, suppress, suppress the truth. And Jesus exposes the truth about God's holiness and our sinfulness. And that's why the name of Jesus in public? Well, that's going to draw a lot of uh, controversy. Oh, why? Why? Because of this, right? There's judgment. And man suppresses the, And suppressing the truth, listen to this. Suppressing that truth in particular shows up the arrogance of man, shows up our pride. That we're going to save ourselves. We're going to do it ourselves. Thank you very much. And throughout human history. That's been the case. From Cain killing Abel. To the Tower of Babel. Through everywhere. Why was Jesus crucified? Because he was bringing out the truth. He was bringing out light. And especially that everyone needs a savior. What? Don't you know I'm good enough? Look, I'm not doing all these terrible, terrible things. I'm a good person. Thank you very much. No, compared to God, you are unholy, ungodly, deserving of judgment. That sounds harsh. That sounds terrible. But it's the truth. It's the truth. And so, no, no, I'm going to hide that. But as I try to hide that, that shows my arrogance and my pride. 
Whenever, whoever wants to hide that. And uh, God's reaction to pride and to arrogance. Oh, my, 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 my. It's, uh, and again, this is truth. Uh, Proverbs chapter 6, by way of introduction, Proverbs chapter 6. Uh, Proverbs are, well, <laughs> sometimes they can be pretty rough. Proverbs chapter 6 and verse 16. Proverbs chapter 6 and verse 16 says this. There are six things which the Lord hates. Yes, seven which are an abomination to him. Whenever the scripture says uh, there's three sins. No, there's four. There's six. No, there's seven. The indication this is full and intense. If it is sin, it is full and intense sin. Remember earlier parts in, in Amos? It was repeated over and over and over. Here, it's for six, no, seven. Meaning, here is the full and intense hatred of God towards something. God's hatred? Well, I thought God was just good and benevolent. And Well, you haven't read the scriptures. For him it says six things that he hates, no seven on an abomination to the top of the list, at the very top of the list of what God fully and intensely hates. Look at the next verse. Verse 17. Haughty eyes. The human pride. A lying tongue and hands that shed innocent blood. But at the top of the list, haughty eyes. And you know why he hates that? You know why he's so intense in his hatred towards haughty eyes to pride? Because pride and arrogance lead to destruction. It leads to corruption to loss of life, to death. That's why. And when we try to work independent of God, thinking that we don't need Him, or at least, okay, every once in a while, yeah, 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 I'll pray to God when I'm in crisis. No. And it's going to lead to destruction. You see? And, and, and God is, a, is, is the perfect parent Seeks to communicate with love and mercy, but when there's pride, he's like, no! In Isaiah 50, Isaiah 50, uh, he calls out, because we live in darkness. We live in times where, you know, all kinds of problems. And he offers the solution. But when we don't want to turn to him for the solution, then there's consequences. Uh, Isaiah 50, verse 10. Who is among you that fears the Lord, that obeys the voice of his servant, that walks in darkness and has no light? Don't we all have that common experience as Christians? We are Christians and yet we experience all the fallenness and all the darkness outside, inside, everywhere. That's the reality. But we turn to the Lord and he says, you're living in this situation? Let him trust in the name, in the character, the name of the Lord, and rely on his God. You see that? But, the next verse. Behold, all you who kindle a fire, who encircle yourselves with firebrands, walk in the light of your fire among the brands you have set ablaze. This you will have from my hand. You will lay down in torment. God speaks very clearly. We can't miss it. I'm not just fire and brimstone type of preacher. 
But it's right there. It's right there. You will lie down in torment. Don't be self-reliant, self-sufficient, arrogantly thinking that you can do it on your own. No, no, no. And so we have to raise the questions of ourselves because before we get to Amos, because Amos also it's just very, very clear. We may not think so, and some of those prophets are like, man, why do they say what they say? Like, that's confusing. And we're going to try and unpack that. But we need to ask of ourselves, what are you and I relying on the Lord for? We all claim to rely on the Lord, but we rely on the Lord for what? Well, uh, we want the Lord for, seek the Lord, rely on Him for blessings. That's not bad. Uh, relying on the Lord for good health. At my age, I rely on the Lord for good health. <laughs> because forget it, right? Last night I had a piece of cake. This morning I took my blood and I'm like, woo! Ha! Psh, psh. Right? It's not bad to rely on the Lord for good health. Relying on the Lord to keep our loved ones, that's not bad. But what does the Lord want us to rely upon Him the most? He wants us to rely on him for mercy and grace. Because that is the deepest need that we have. You see? And so when we rely on the Lord for that, for mercy and grace, and appreciate the forgiveness of the cross, oh my, everything else, even our health becomes secondary. No, no, no. Faith on the line. <laughs> but that's the question. Do we? Because, you see, when we rely on the Lord for mercy and grace, we have to be humble and admit, and admit that we need mercy and grace. Uh, but perhaps we rely too much on our own accomplishments, our own abilities. On our own mental acumen, our own prowess physically, our own financial successes, what have you. Maybe that's what we're relying on. And the grace and mercy of God is like, well, yeah, that's poetry. That's good. But deep, profoundly, we don't know him that well. And we don't know ourselves that well. And so Amos comes and... Uh, <laughs> We've gone through Amos a number of times, uh, or not the whole book, but we're plowing through it. And Amos seems to use a jackhammer. Let's break that heart. Trying to break the heart. And um, the people in Amos' time weren't listening. They, they just refused. In fact, Amos was preaching and they, they didn't like it at all. So we're going to cover Amos chapter 6, verses 8 through 14. Amos 6. 8 through 14. And what we find here is that the Lord severely, the Lord severely judges arrogant self-reliance and calls us to obediently respect Him. Obediently respect Him. We start off, and by the way, I'm going to go through this passage kind of like someone said. It's kind of like when we get up in the morning and we put our clothes on, right? First this leg, and then this leg, and then and this shirt, this, and then, and then finally, right? This morning, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go through some of the verses, and then go to this other verse, and then come back to this other verse. So if you get confused, be happy. Um, in verse uh, 8, God shows that how he abhors self-reliance. He abhors self-reliance. And then in verse 12, the reason God judges self-reliance, the reason why God judges self-reliance. Verse 13, God exposes self-reliance. And then a mixture of verses to look at how God judges self-reliance. Let me read the passage. God has been over and over and over confronting the nations around Israel, and then he focuses on Israel, zeroes in on his own people, his own people, and he's nailing his own people. 
So we're starting verse 8. The Lord God has sworn by himself. The Lord God of hosts has declared, I loathe the arrogance of Jacob and detest his citadels. Therefore, I will deliver up the city and all it contains. And it will be if 10 men are left in one house, they will die. Then one's loved one, or it's translated uncle here in the New American Standard. Uh, then one's loved one or his undertaker will lift, up his, lift him up to carry out his bones from the house. And he will say to the one who is in the innermost part of the house, is anyone else with you? And that one will say, no one. Then he will answer, keep quiet, for the name of the Lord is not to be mentioned. For behold, the Lord is going to command that the great house be smashed to pieces and small houses to fragments. Do horses run on rocks? Or do one plow them with oxen? Yet you have turned justice into poison and the fruit of righteousness into wormwood. You rejoice over Lodabar and say, we have, have we not by our own strength taken Carnaim for ourselves? For behold, I'm going to raise up a nation against you, O house of Israel, declares the Lord of hosts, and they will afflict you from the entrance of Hamath to the brook of the Arabah. First of all, God abhors self-reliance. Haughty eyes. Uh, it says, verse 8, the Lord has sworn. What do we say we swear? Why do we say, I swear to you. I'm telling you, but we're saying this is true. This is true. Right? And then, what do we swear by? Well, you go to be a whatever big president or whatever. Where's the Bible? I swear by the Bible. I swear by my mother's grave. I swear by, and we try to do the highest so that people know that we're speaking the truth, right? Well, what does God say? <laughs> what does God swear by? There it is. I'm not making it up. Look, verse 8. The Lord swore by himself. The Lord of hosts has declared. There is nothing higher. I swear by my very character. Absolute holiness. Absolute righteousness. Wow. You begin to think like. I think God is a little serious. Yes, he is. He is. Right? I mean, he can swear by no higher. By himself, his very character. I mean, what does he swear? What, what's true? I loathe. I totally, completely, I, I want to vomit. I hate. I loathe the arrogance of Jacob. Why Jacob? Uh, the Bible is just so, it's the word of God. So every word has meaning. Sometimes he uses Joseph. Here he uses Jacob. Why Jacob? Jacob means supplanter, trickster, deceiver. That's what it means. So when God is, I hate the arrogance of this trickster. And he's talking about his own people. <sighs> wow. I load the arrogance of Jacob. And detest his citadels. The citadels were the military bases. Very, very well certified, uh, yeah, um, fortified, powerful. And God says, I detest that. I detest your military successes because you began to rely on them 
rather than me. You see this self-reliance? And that's what God is loathing. He's detesting. It really raises the question of ourselves. Because we have to be very, very aware. Right? It's this arrogance that he hates. Um, And then God says, um, I'm going to skip down to... uh, Verse 12, because here, and by the way, doesn't it sound like today? What are we relying on? We're the world's superpower? Hmm. Financially, we're able to send out checks to the point that people don't want to work anymore. The government's going to take care of me. What are we relying on? My, 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 my. All our military successes, the Pentagon, the building of the United Nations is but a long shadow of the Tower of Babel. The Tower of Babel in Genesis 11, where man said, we're going to reach heaven. We're going to make a name for ourselves apart from God. But you see, most of the time, we don't want to think like that. We're good people. And there are sins in which we are because God has saved us and given us his Holy Spirit. And we're able to please the Lord in many ways. But as a nation, as a nation, what are we relying on? Surely we cannot go down because we're powerful. We have great citadels. But what about the name of Jesus? Is it freely spoken of? Do we readily turn to the Lord in such times? Or do we turn to the Pentagon? That's where we are. And God says, um, why is it? That I need to judge this self-reliance. Verse 12. Do horses run on rocks? Literally the Hebrew is singular. Rock. Do you run horses on concrete? Well, no. Why? They're going to slip and fall. I remember we, we, we have cows. And one time one of the cows got out. And Nancy was over there trying and gave, everybody was trying to, right? And the cow runs and <laughs> runs on, onto the driveway of the house. <laughs> Boom! Falls flat. We jump on the cow and <laughs> we, <laughs> we all jump on the cow because on concrete, their hooves, they, they have no traction. In fact, if it's on the rock, These horses are going to be ruined. They're going to be ruined. And then, do you plow rock with the oxen? It's going to ruin the oxen. So something that can be powerfully and beautiful and and a great tool is ruined. And that's the point. Because he says... Yet you have turned justice into poison. What should help society? What should help people to be just? When somebody does wrong, they need to be punished and dealt with. Oh no, you got enough money? You can get away. And it turns into poison for the whole society. That's why I have to judge it. Because it's ruined the very good things I've given you. And then, and the fruit of righteousness into wormwood. Wormwood is something bitter. Very bitter. 
You know, when, 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 when you live in, in the context of righteousness, there can be peace and joy and enjoyment and safety. But when righteousness is turning to bitterness, it ruins everything. And that's why God says, I have to judge it. Because the very things I've given you, it's poisonous and it's bitter. The whole society goes down. And that's why. Uh, And, I mean, today, doing what is right does not lead to appreciation. Doing what is right does not lead to appreciation. Yeah. In fact, it, uh, it draws scorn and ridicule and heartache. You try to say and do what is right. I mean, uh, it can be, you know, uh, a mom that decides to stay home and, and, and be the homemaker and raise children. You go to work and they'll scorn at that woman. You know, how dare you? What? You're going to get married? Are you dumb or what? My body, my rights, honey. Careful. God is watching. Praise be to God for Jesus, no? Praise be to God for Jesus. But God says, I have to judge when there's an arrogance, a refusal to look at how justice is being perverted and righteousness is being turned to something bitter. That's what God is saying through Amos. And God exposes the self-reliance in verse 13. Uh, You who rejoice in Lodabar and say... Have we not by our own strength taken Karnaman for ourselves? Uh, <laughs> it's real interesting. Lodabar, it's a, it's a hard translation uh, to, to kind of pinpoint, but apparently it's a, it was a city, but it literally means nothing. <laughs> uh, a very little of, of not, the King James translates that. <laughs> You're rejoicing in nothing, Lodabar. You think you're hot stuff and you're Lodabar. Nothingness. And then by your own self, Carloman was a, um, a, a city in the main trade route. And there was, there was some substance there, but it, it was conquered four or five times. It was nothing. And you're boasting on that. Really? In contrast, I mean, these are no names. And you're boasting on that. that those achievements. My goodness. Uh, in contrast to that, we're going to see in verse 14 what God is going to do. In contrast to what they were boasting. And so, um, he exposes... The self-reliance and it's in nothingness, in nothingness. So God says, I'm going to judge. I'm going to judge. And when I judge, it's not going to be pretty. And that means he's judging the self-reliance, the arrogance of his own people. And if it's of his own people, imagine those that are not. That's why people need the Lord. That's why the world needs the gospel. Because it is the only way to salvation. It is God's, God's provision for a lost world. You see, that's why they need the gospel. Because if not, they're going to face judgment. And here's the judgment starting at the very end of verse 8, right? The end of verse 8. Therefore, I will deliver up the city and all it contains. The city, uh, when we, if you live out in the boondocks in the middle of nowhere, every time you go to the city, you better plan. 
to buy all the stuff that you need because then you're going to have to go all the way back over there. But man, if you live in the city, ooh, Houston, San Antonio, man, White and Waterworld and Astros and, well, Cowboys, you know. But, you know, you live in the city and you have all kinds of goodies, all kinds of hospitals and everything. God says, well, I'm going to wipe them out. The city and all it contains. Huh. Verse 9. And it will be if 10 men are left in one house, they will die. Um, in Genesis 18, um, this is when Abraham was telling God, hey, God, if there's a, what, God told Abraham, I'm going to destroy the city. And, and Abraham says, oh, God, man, if there's 50, would you save it? Okay. If there's 40, what do you think, God? All right. If there's 30, and that's where we get the, the, the saying, you're going to Jew them down. <laughs> Abraham was Jewing God down. Well, here, basically, what God is saying is, you ain't going to Jew me down for nothing. If there's 10, all 10 are going to be wiped out. Wow. And then, verse 10. Then one's uncle, the Hebrew there could be a loved one or a, a relative, and I think it's a, a relative or a loved one, rather than an uncle, but be that as it may. Then one's relative or loved one or a uh, and the sense there, this verse is very hard to translate from the Hebrew, but I think the meaning is the ones that are going to carry out the, the bones of the dead to go burn them or bury them. Somebody's going to, a loved one, a relative is going to be that survived, and they're going to come and take the bones of the dead people. Uh, and those relatives are going to know what's up. They know it is of God, this judgment. Uh, and he will say to the one who is in the innermost part of the house, is anyone else with you? Any survivors? And that one will say, no one. Then the loved one will say, shut up. Then he will answer, keep quiet. For the name of the Lord is not to be mentioned. Wow. Um, Psalm 46. Psalm 46. Uh, and this uh, psalm is uh, misapplied uh, many times. Psalm 46.10 Cease or stop and know that I am God. Right? Usually that's quoted for comfort. Hey, stop. God is in control. Just know that I am God. But you know that's not the right application. This psalm is about judgment. When God will judge the whole world. It's like... Um, you know, if you work for a company and someone really, really high up on the company, if not the owner, comes and you see a frown on his face and he's angry, anybody going to tell a joke at that point? I remember I was a, a member of the National Board of Directors of the Evangelical Free Church of America. And we would go and have meetings. And I wasn't aware of this until several years later when one of the employees told me uh, this. But we would have meetings, and we would come out of the meetings, right, for a break or whatever, and the employees were there because it was at the home office. But I was told, man, Ruben, I, I, I'm so, so appreciative of when you would come out of those meetings. I say, why? Because... Most of the time, you had a smile on your face. Like, so? Yeah. Because if you came out with, like, sadness, our heads were coming off. We might get fired. Or we might, like, really? Yeah. 
and we're a bunch of sinners. When God decides to judge, the whole world. Just look at verse 6 of Psalm 8. Um, Psalm 46. Psalm 46, verse 6. The nations made an uproar. The kingdoms tottered. He raised his voice and the earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. Come, behold the works of the Lord who has wrought desolation in the earth. <laughs> and when he does, stop striving and know that I'm the Almighty who will judge into eternity. That's what Amos is saying. What will happen when God judges. And the undertaker, those come to take the bodies, don't even mention the name of the Lord. That's what he's saying. For behold, the Lord is going to command that the great house is smashed to pieces and the small house to fragments. There's nothing going to be left. Nothing is going to be left. All the big houses, all the skyscrapers, everything down to dust. And in contrast, remember verse 14, Lodabar, nothingness. They were boasting in nothingness. There's two little cities that they conquered were nothing. Oh, we did this. Oh, we're great. Oh, God says, I'm going to wipe the whole nation. And I'm going to use just another nation. Verse 14, for behold, I'm going to raise up a nation against you, O house of Israel. Declares the Lord God of hosts. Once again, the God of hosts, the Lord of hosts. The God of all the angel armies. Angels are very, very powerful, and there are many, many angels. And God is the general of them all. He is the omnipotent God. He can carry out what he's saying is the point. Amen. And they will afflict you. The Hebrew there is oppress you. Like you're oppressing the needy now? You're oppressing the world, the ones that don't have power, that don't have any means. I'm now going to be the oppressor and I'm going to oppress you. And they will afflict you, oppress you from the entrance of Hamad to the brook of the Arabah, from the north to the south, the whole thing. You boasted on two little cities. <laughs> I'm going to take care of the whole nation and I'm going to use another nation. You know, we, we don't know God very well. That's the problem. And sometimes we don't know ourselves very well. We think we're hot stuff. We think that because we have outward successes, that qualifies us to be okay. Oh, we need to look at our hearts. So I start off with my applications. In verse 8, what did he say? I loathe the arrogance of Jacob. Uh, we must be humble. We must be humble. Proverbs 16. Proverbs 16 for my first application. Proverbs 16. Verse 18 through and 19. Proverbs 16. Verses 18 and 19. Pride goes before destruction. And a haughty spirit before stumbling. It is better to be humble in spirit with the lowly than to divide the spoil with the proud. That's wisdom. That's wisdom. And just to add to that wisdom, James 4 in the New Testament, James chapter 4, right after Hebrews, James 4 and verse 6. This is a scary verse. Uh, James 4 verse 6. But he gives 
a greater grace. Therefore, it says, God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. The first part is what's scary. God is opposed to the proud. You have some pride and arrogance in you? Guess who's your enemy? God himself. Imagine God as your enemy. <laughs> I think I need to be humble. Yeah. Whatever it takes, brothers and sisters, examine. Is there some pride in you? Oh, I've got money. Oh, I've got talents. Oh, I've got successes here and there. Oh, yeah, that's careful. Very careful. Uh, so we must be humble in life. Right? Uh, second application. Uh, back in verse 10 in Amos chapter 6, uh, and then in verse 14, God judges, right? And so that means, and by the way, that was of his own people. Of his own people. Uh, so for us, we need to deeply respect God. Have an awe and a respect to him that says, I'm going to obey him. I need to obey him. Right? Uh, and not just fear his judgment, but now with greater revelation into the New Testament. Heaven, he's instructing them, and just, I'll just read a few verses. Uh, John 14, verse 15. If you love me, you see that? Now in the New Testament, because of greater revelation and Jesus Christ having come, now we, out of love, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. I will ask of my Father and he will give you another helper that he may be with you forever. That is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it does not see him or know him, but you know him because he abides with you and will be in you I will not leave you as orphans I will come to you God so loves us not only did he pay for our sins he didn't leave us alone he gave us his spirit and he himself is with us verse 19 after a little while the world will not, no longer see me but you will see me because I live and you will live also in that day you will know that I am in the father and you in me, and I in you, we're going to be united. And out of that unity, out of that love, now we obey his commandments. He who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my father. And I will love him, and I will disclose myself to him. You're going to know me personally, intimately, not just rationally, not just because I know the Bible. No, I know God personally. And how do we get there? As we obey him. Because it's easy to say, I love God and not obey him. What commandments? Huh. How about making disciples? You making any disciples in the past 40 years? Past 30 years? Past 20 years, 10 years, 10 days, obey his commandments and make disciples. How about love one another? And don't wait for the other to love you first. No, you love first. Because God loved us first. Speak the truth in love. Confess your sins one to another. Exhort one another. Pray for one another. Oh, man, the commandments go on and on and on. But it's because we are to love him out of love, you see. That was my second application. My last application is this. In Amos chapter 6, verse 12, what happens? 
you turn, you transform justice into poison and the fruit of righteousness into wormwood. Mor morally, it was a massive failure. Listen to this. Morally, they were a massive failure. But externally, financially, militarily, they were a great success. So the application is, we need to look at our morality. The kingdom of God in righteousness is top priority, not the physical, financial successes. You know why I say that? Because the world is constantly pushing for physical success. Just do it. All the commercials, oh my goodness. Work hard, work hard. Work hard and you can do it. And you have all these, you know, athletes super cut, big old rope. They're like, oh my goodness, oh, I wanna be like them. Uh, they wear the right underwear. That's what they're advertising. The right drink. And you'll be, all the physical, but the morality. We're killing babies. We're accepting immorality. And the name of Jesus can't even be named. You think God is not watching? And that's why for us as Christians, we need to be careful that we put morality, God's, judge, God's righteousness as top priority. Not whether we're successful in all kinds of other ways. Matthew 6, one of my favorite passages for me to go back to over and over and over because I'm just like you. I forget. Matthew 6. Verse 33. Matthew 6, verse 33. But seek ye first. The Greek there first uh, is priority. Top priority. Above everything else. Top priority. Seek ye first his kingdom. And his righteousness. Are we living life in a righteous way? The way we speak. The way we dress. The way we spend money. The way decisions we make. The way we speak to one another. Is it righteous? Or is it self-serving? We need to put morality. Above everything else. You see, because the world doesn't care. You know what they care about? If you have likes. And you know how you can get likes? Show a little bit more skin. <laughs> or do all kinds of things. It doesn't, they don't care about your soul. As long as they entrapped you. The morality doesn't matter to them. You think all these products really care about your soul? Are you kidding me? It's bottom line, honey. Bottom line. And if we're not careful, that's all we go by, the bottom line. And the book of Amos is saying, no, no. God is in his throne, and he will not be mocked. No. It's wonderful that God warns us. And God tells us over and over and over. Should we be surprised? If there's one, two, three more pandemics worse than we've had? It shouldn't shock us at all. You see, but normally we don't think like that. We don't think like that. God help us. God help us. Because God severely, severely 
judges arrogant self-reliance and calls us to obediently respect him. Heavenly Father, thank you for all your goodness, Lord, especially the cross, delivering us, Lord, from the just punishment that we deserve. Oh, God, may your spirit have freedom with all our hearts, Lord. And we, may we look to your tender mercies and appreciate your tender mercies and grace towards us, God. Why you are so good to us is beyond us. And thank you for the book of Amos, Lord, that so clearly spells out that in your holiness, you go after evil. Thank you, Father. If there's anyone here, Lord, who today, today has put their trust in Jesus as their Savior, bless them, Father. Help them grow in truth. And if we can be of any part, Lord, instruments of yours to help them, please show us, Lord. Thank you again, and we come in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. So let my life be the proof, the proof of your